Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in a new series today called Revelation, The Triumph of the Lamb. Are you ready for the rapture? Learn about God's timeline with the lesson, When is the Rapture Coming? It was in the 1800s that a man named William Miller, a New York evangelist, predicted the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it was going to happen between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. Well, when March 21st, 1844, came and went. He said, I made a miscalculation. It's April 18th, 1844, and he missed that date too. Fast forward about 140 years, and a NASA engineer named Edgar Wisenot wrote a book entitled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is Coming in 1988. Specifically, he said it was coming September 11th through the 13th but it came and went. Then he wrote another book, 88 Reasons Why I Was Wrong. No, he didn't really write that book. (laughs) But you know, his first book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988, sold 4.5 million copies. Harold Camping, just in recent days, predicted that Jesus was coming on October 21st, 2011. That came and went. Then we had the Mayan calendar that said the end of the world was coming on December 21st, 2012. Hey, date setting for the return of the Lord is not something new, but it is something very foolish. Jesus said, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. He went on to say, therefore, be on the alert. Be ready, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Hey, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? We don't know when it's going to be. He just told us to be ready. Now, we're in a series on the book of Revelation called The Triumph of the Lamb. And the focus of Revelation is the future. Now, John was on the island of Patmos when the Lord came to him. He saw Jesus in all his glory, and Jesus gives us the outline of the book in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. He told John, write the things which you have seen. That's Revelation chapter 1. He said, write the things which are, and that's Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then he said, write the things which must take place after these things. That's the future. That's Revelation chapter 4 to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22. That is the outline. And we read in chapter 4 these words. After these things, John said, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting on the throne, he, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. John hears the voice of the Lord, just like he heard in Revelation chapter 1, sounded like a trumpet, but it was the voice of the Lord, and the Lord is speaking to John, and the Lord is telling John, come up here. 
and there's a door open in heaven, and he comes up, and then he sees things from sees what's going on in heaven, and he starts to see things from heaven's perspective. Now, there are Bible scholars who see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, a kind of a, a veiled reference to this thing we call the rapture. And they say, you know, that sure sounds like the rapture where there's a trumpet, there's the voice of the Lord, he's calling up John, and it's a picture of what the Bible talks about as the rapture of the church. Not everybody believes that. I believe that, and I'm going to tell you today why I believe that. So we want to talk in our series on Revelation, we want to talk about this thing called the rapture. And we want together to make three discoveries about this thing called the rapture. Discovery number one answers the question, well, what is the rapture? The rapture is the catching away of the Lord's saints. That's what the rapture is. And the Bible speaks of the rapture. It might be kind of veiled, a veiled cryptic reference in Revelation 4, 1, but we have other passages of Scripture that speak very clearly about this thing called the rapture. Now, the classic passage for the rapture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this is what Paul told these believers. But we do not want you to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep, Asleep is a euphemism for died. Those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. What do we say? Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And so those who have died, their body goes in the grave, but their spirit goes to be with the Lord. That's why he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That is the classic passage on the rapture. And some of you are saying, but it doesn't say rapture anywhere. I've, def I've looked in my Bible. I've looked in the concordance. I can't find the word rapture anywhere in the Bible. It it's not in the English Bible. Well, you know what else is not in the English Bible? The word Trinity. The Bible teaches the Trinity. It doesn't use the word Trinity. The Bible teaches the rapture. It doesn't use the word rapture, at least not in the English Bible. We get the word rapture from the Latin, and Jerome, who wrote the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Scriptures, he uses the word, the Latin word, rapio, from which we get the English word rapture. And it's right there in that scripture, and it says in verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Caught up is where we get the word rapture. It's harpazo in the Greek, and it means to snatch away, to catch away, to seize by force. It's the same word used 13 times in the New Testament. It's the same word when Jesus was talking about the sower went out to sow some seed and some seed fell on the hard uh, ground, on the hard pan, and the devil comes and snatches it away. He, he harpazos it. He, he seizes it. Well, the Scripture says that there is coming a day when the Lord is going to seize and catch away and snatch away and rapture those who belong to him. The rapture is the catching away of the Lord's saints. Now, don't get the idea that to be a saint means you have to be some uh, higher up in the church that did some great, awesome things, and then you die, and then they vote on you after uh, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it is, and they make you a saint, and then you're a saint. There are not a lot of saints if that's the criteria, uh, but that's not the criteria for being a saint. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you turn from sin and you turn to the Savior, the Lord makes you his saint. 
You know, there are really only two kinds of people in the world. They're the saints and the ain'ts. They're those who know Christ and those who don't know Christ. There are those who are in Christ and those who are in Adam. And the Bible says in Adam all die, in Christ are all made alive. So at the rapture, the Lord comes back for his own, for those who have been born again, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, those who are his saints, and he snatches them away. Second discovery. The rapture is a certain future event. It's a certain event. It's a future event. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 14, on the night in which he was betrayed, he's talking to his disciples. Judas has already left the, uh, the upper room to go do what he was going to do in betraying Jesus. And Jesus said to the disciples that he was going to have to go away. And he knew their hearts were saddened. And he said to them in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. From the lips of Jesus, he spoke of this rapture when he would come and take his saints, take his beloved to be with him where he is. Not that he would be with us where we are, but that we would be with him. And then another passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, speaks of the rapture. And it says this, behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, a mystery was something that hadn't previously been made aware to God's people. And Paul, God was using Paul to open people's eyes to this truth that previously they weren't aware of. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That happens at the rapture, when the Lord comes back, when he comes back in the clouds and when he comes back in the clouds and the trumpet blows, the Bible says it's in a twinkling of an eye. The fastest movement of the human body is the twinkling of an eye. It doesn't say the blink of an eye, it's the twinkling of an eye, which is much faster than the blink of an eye and it's just like that. And we're snatched away, taken to be with the Lord who appears in the clouds. And we go up in the air to be with him. And on our way up, we are changed. We're made like him. It says in Philippians chapter 3, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform this, the humble state of our body into conformity with the body of his glory through the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So we're going to be made like Jesus. First John chapter 3, John says, it, it hasn't appeared as yet what we shall be like. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. So he's going to make us like himself. When does that happen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, and we are going up to be with him, he takes us to the Father's house. Now notice this. When we talk about the coming of the Lord, there is the rapture that the Bible speaks of, and then there is the return of the Lord that the Bible speaks of. These are different because if you read about them, you say, well, these don't, they can't be the same event. They have to be different events. For instance, we read that at the rapture, the Lord is coming for his saints, at the return of Christ, Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says he comes with his saints. And at the rapture, he comes in the clouds, but at the return of Christ, he comes down to the Mount of Olives. He sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splits. He comes back at the battle of Armageddon. At the rapture, we have no signs no signs that we, we're just told, be ready. You don't know when I'm coming, so just be ready. At the return of Christ, lots of signs. Lots of things have to happen. See, Revelation is primarily chronological. So lots of things have to happen before Jesus comes back again. At the rapture, he comes in redemption. At the return, he comes in judgment. And he takes out his 
enemies with that sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. The rapture is a certain thing, very, very different from the return of Christ. And here is where Bible believers differ. We all have to say the Bible teaches about a rapture. But where we differ is when does the rapture come? When is the rapture coming? So disagreement comes in the timing of the rapture. And so I know that there are lots of pastors, they don't like to to preach on Revelation because they say, ah, it's too much, too much uncertainty there. I'm just not really sure about this, and it could be this, it could be that. So I'm just going to stay away from it. Well, I don't think we should do that. Uh, the Bible calls the, the rapture the uh, blessed hope. It calls it the comfort. Uh, comfort one another with these words. So let's look at the different views of the rapture because anybody who believes the Bible would say, okay, well, Revelation... or 1 Thessalonians 4, that happens sometime. Jesus comes to take us to the Father's house. That's going to happen sometime. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. That's going to happen sometime. So when does it happen? Now, there's a chart I want you to see that shows three different main positions on when this happens. And these are all from the perspective that Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he sets up his kingdom. And we have a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, Revelation chapter 20. It's called the millennial kingdom from the Latin milli, which means a thousand, and annum, which means year. A thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. The son of David takes up residence on earth in Jerusalem. That's the capital city, and he'll rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years. Now, before that, you have a tribulation period. Talked about in Daniel chapter, 20, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Talks about this tribulation time. And verse 27 especially talks about seven years. And it says that the, the nation of Israel is going to make a covenant with the Antichrist. And that covenant is going to last one week. Not a week of days, a week of years. And in the middle of the week... The Antichrist is going to show his true colors. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to set himself up in the temple of God and display himself as God and says, you worship me. And Jesus said, when that happens, that's the abomination of desolation, when the abominable one comes in the temple and makes it desolate, and then comes the great tribulation. So the tribulation period is seven years, but it's half and half. First three and a half years are bad. Second three and a half years are horrible. And if the Lord doesn't cut that short, everybody dies. That's how bad it is. But the first one says you can have a viewpoint, the pre-tribulation rapture, which means that you believe Jesus is coming back in the clouds, like 1 Thessalonians 4 says, and that happens before the tribulation comes, before the wrath of God hits this earth. And then he comes back again at the end of the tribulation to fight the battle of Armageddon and set up his thousand-year reign. And uh, at the end of thousand years, there's a final judgment, and then comes the eternal state. Well, some people say, no, 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 it's a mid-tribulation rapture, which means they believe the rapture is coming, but they think it's coming at that middle point of the tribulation where the Antichrist declares himself to be God, and there's the abomination of desolation, and that's when Jesus comes back. And there's a third group that says, no, 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 you guys are wrong. He comes back at the end of the tribulation, and the church goes through the tribulation, and then at the very end, when the Lord comes to return, right before he returns, there's a rapture and return, and they're just like together like that, and they say that's how that works. Now, in the 1970s, another guy came up with a fourth view, and that view was called the pre-wrath rapture. So here's the four views of the timing of the rapture. Pre-tribulation, you have rapture and then the wrath of God, which is the tribulation period, the wrath of God. Mid-trib says you have the wrath. They put it at the middle, and then they say that's the wrath of God. Pre-wrath says that the tribulation period, about five out of those seven years, it's the wrath of Satan, and the church goes through that. But then those last two years where it's the wrath of God, that's when the Lord takes us out. So it's kind of a three-quarter view. And then the post-tribulation says we go through all the wrath of God, and the rapture comes when the Lord comes back at the end of the tribulation. So those are the different views. Now, some people say Augustine, you've heard that name, Augustine in the 400s A.D., 
He said, well, I think the thought of the thousand-year reign of Christ is just symbolic. So he's not a, a millennialist. He's an amillennialist. And amillennialism means this. There is no thousand-year reign of Jesus. It's all just spiritual. And so those guys believe something like this. You have the present age, and then right now we are in the millennium. And then Christ comes back at the end, there's final judgment, and then there's just eternal heaven. So just if, if you believe Augustine, you can rejoice right now that you're in the millennial kingdom. Does it feel like that to you? It sure doesn't to me. Uh, I don't think that all millennialism is true at all. I think if you believe the Bible uh, and really don't try and spiritualize all this stuff away, you believe as the scripture says in Revelation chapter 20, that the Lord rules and reigns for 1,000 years. That's very, very clear. So those are the different views. And see, it's not that we disagree that, oh, there, I don't think there's going to be a rapture. The rapture is taught. It's when is it coming. And that leads us to discovery number three. And this is me sharing with you what I believe. The rapture is coming next. The rapture is coming next. Ed Heinsohn, who has the King is Coming broadcast, professor at Liberty University, he was sharing in a sermon. He said he was at a Presbyterian church, and he said that the pastor was preaching to his congregation, and uh, he didn't like the idea of the rapture uh, coming before the tribulation. He just didn't like the idea of the rapture at all. So he told his church, this. He said, listen, there is no rapture coming for you. The only thing we have to look forward to as believers in Jesus is trouble, trouble, and more trouble. And Heinsohn said when he said that, you could hear the moans coming from the audience. Well, listen, the, the information about the rapture Comfort one another with these words. So if all we have to look forward to is trouble, 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 the Antichrist is coming, he's going to try and brand you with 666. If you don't get the 666, the mark of the beast, he's going to kill you, and you're going to die probably, and your children are going to die, and it's just going to be horrible. Well, that's not a real comforting thought. But we comfort one another with these words that the Lord is coming back. Now, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Remember this. Paul went to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. He was only there three weeks. In three weeks, he led a multitude of Gentiles to faith in Jesus Christ. And in three weeks, this is uh, 50 AD or so, 50, 51 AD. In three weeks, he taught those brand new believers, the Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming soon. And he wrote them wrote them in about 51, 52 A.D., the book of 1 Thessalonians, and they were having questions about the return of the Lord. And so he said, listen, here's how this works, and he explains it to them. And then he writes them 2 Thessalonians. They thought they missed the coming of the Lord. He said, no, you haven't missed it. Don't let somebody shake you from your position. Those people were believing that the Lord was coming soon. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, they were to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And they were waiting, expectantly waiting, these people in 51 AD for Jesus to come again. And you know what? Paul was waiting too thinking that Jesus was coming in his lifetime at any moment. You didn't know when he was coming, so we're just waiting. We're expecting him to return. Now, why would a person believe that the rapture comes before the tribulation period? Why would anyone believe that? Let me give you six reasons why I believe that. Number one, because the Lord promised to deliver us from the coming wrath. He hasn't destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. He says to the faithful church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I, will also, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. 
the hour of testing. What's he talking about? He's talking about the tribulation period. That comes upon the whole earth, and he's going to keep the faithful from that hour. He's going to snatch them away, deliver them, take them out of that hour. He promised that we wouldn't experience his wrath. What is the tribulation period? It's God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting, unbelieving world. Well, he hasn't chosen me for wrath. Jesus took all my wrath. So why would he leave me here as his saint, as his child, to pour out his wrath upon me? It doesn't make sense. That's not what the Lord does. He saves us from that. Second reason, the Lord doesn't mention the church in the tribulation. This is interesting. When we read in Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, the church is mentioned 18 times. 18 times. And then we get to Revelation chapter 4. The church is not mentioned until the end of the book at Revelation 22. All the time during the tribulation, no mention of the church. The only time that we come across the church again is in Revelation chapter 19, and the church is called the bride of Christ. And the bride is adorning herself for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, isn't it, isn't it strange that the Bible, which is written to the church, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All the epistles have to deal with the church. Jesus died for the church. The bride of Christ is the church. And everything is focused on the church, the church, the church, message to the church. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And all of a sudden, you hit Revelation chapter 4. We don't hear anything else about the church. There's no message to the church. There's no information on how do we as the church of Jesus Christ go through the tribulation. How do we handle this? It doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't speak to the church at all. And that's a strong message from silence that there is no mention of the church. Reason number three. The tribulation period is for Israel. It's not for the church. What's the whole point of the tribulation? Well, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, God gave a message to Daniel about the future of Israel. And in that message to Daniel about the future of Israel, there are the last seven years, and he says this is what's going to happen. The, after the Messiah, the prince, because he speaks, and you can do the math and figure out, hey, he tells them to the day what's going to happen when Jesus presents himself to the people on Palm Sunday, and they reject him, and they say, not this man, but Barabbas, just a few days later, Messiah, the prince, is cut off. He's crucified, and the Jews reject their Messiah. They say, not this man, but Barabbas. His blood be upon us and our children, and they reject Jesus. And that's the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that was going to happen. But see, Jesus said, I come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. Another is going to come in his own name and him you will receive. He's speaking of the Antichrist. And when the Antichrist comes to Israel, whenever the beginning of the tribulation is, he signs a covenant with Israel. And they see the Antichrist as their friend and they see the Antichrist as their Messiah. And everything is good between Israel and this Antichrist, and they think that's our long-awaited Messiah because they rejected the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he came in his Father's name. We reject you, Jesus. But this other one comes in his own name. Him they receive. And at the three-and-a-half-year point, the Antichrist shows his true colors, and they say, ah, oh, that's not the Messiah. And they flee. And Jesus said, when the abomination of desolation comes... When you see that happen in the temple, get out of the city because it's going to get really, really bad. The tribulation period is all about Israel. And don't ever get the idea that God is done with Israel. He's not done with Israel. R Romans chapter 11 makes that clear. And the Bible talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. When the fullness of the Gentiles takes place, you think about it. How many people do you know who are Jewish today believe in Jesus? Very few. There's some, but they're very few. You go to Israel, and the Messianic congregations are very small. It's Gentiles who believe in Jesus. 
uh, because the Jews rejected their Messiah. Uh, Paul said he'd go, always go to the synagogue, and then he started go, to go uh, to, after the synagogue, would, they would kick him out. He said, all right, I'm going to the Gentiles. And he went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles responded to the message. Well, there's coming a day when the last person is going to put his faith her faith and trust in Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Gentiles will come in and then the Father will say, Jesus, go and get your bride. Today is your wedding day and the church will be caught up just as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just as Jesus said in John chapter 14, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am in heaven, there you may be also. See, if, if the rapture and the return are all the same, then we don't ever go to the Father's house because Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom on earth. So John chapter 14 has to fit in there somewhere. It fits in before, and then the tribulation period is the Lord dealing with Israel. And it's called in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, the time of Jacob's distress, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's God pouring out his wrath on a disobedient, Christ-rejecting world. Are there going to be Christians during the tribulation period? Lots of them. They get saved during the tribulation. They're called tribulation saints. They're not those that went up in the rapture. They're those that get saved after the rapture, and there are many of them and life is hard, and many, many, many of them get martyred for their faith in Christ. So the tribulation period is for Israel, not the church. Reason number four, we're told to look for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. We're waiting, the Thessalonians were waiting for Jesus to come. Philippians chapter 3, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus doesn't come back at the beginning of the tribulation, he comes back in the middle, then you know what you're going to know? You're going to know those first three and a half years of the tribulation. And you know what? You'll know who the Antichrist is. And so if that's your theology, then it, it, you would say, I, I'm not going to be looking for Jesus because I know he's not coming back until the middle point of the, the tribulation or he's not coming back to the end of the tribulation. So what I'm going to look for is I'm going to look and try and see who the Antichrist is. Because the Antichrist has to set up his kingdom. That's the way the scripture lays it out in chronology. But we're not supposed to do that. I like what Ed Heinsohn says. He says, hey, if you figure out who the Antichrist is, you know what? You've been left behind. Be because Jesus, we wait for him. He comes and takes us out of here. And then the motion starts in for the tribulation. So reason number five. We see the church in heaven before the tribulation. Look again in Revelation chapter 4. It says in verse 4, John's caught up. He sees the throne. He sees God on the throne. And then it says in verse 4, and around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And the question is, who are they? Who are the 24 elders that John saw? Some commentators say, well, they're angels. Angels are never referred to as elders. Angels don't wear crowns. Angels uh, don't wear white garments. They're, they're, not, they're not given garments like that. So it's not angels. It's people, redeemed people. And it's 24 of them. Some people say, well, you know, there were 24 uh, classifications of priests, categories of priests, and so we're a kingdom of priests, and so maybe that's 24, that just signifies the church, could be. Or it could be that it's 12 and 12, 12 tribes in the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New Testament. 12 is an important number in God's economy. 12, the number 12 is used 23 times in the book of the Revelation. There are 12 gates and 12 pearls in God's heaven. There are 12 foundation stones. And I think when he talks about 24 elders, what does John see? He sees the redeemed from the Old Testament 
represented by the 12 tribes of Israel. He sees the redeemed from the New Testament, the church represented by the 12 apostles. Judas was obviously an apostate. Some say, well, Matthias took Judas's place. I believe God chose Paul to take Judas's place. But regardless, you have the 12 in the New Testament, the 12 in the Old Testament. It's a picture of all the redeemed from the Old Testament. It's a picture of all the redeemed, the church from the New Testament. And so how does the church go through the tribulation if the church is up in heaven and John sees that? As John MacArthur says, we beat the tribulation by two chapters. It doesn't come till chapter 6. We're already in heaven in chapter 4. Hey, that's pretty good news. I like that. And you say, well, how do you know that the 24 elders are not angels? Because there's song. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song. This is talking about the 24 elders. Saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Speaking to the Jesus for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Angels are not redeemed beings. They're made perfect beings. You and I are redeemed beings. That means that you were lost in sin and the Lord saved you and you are redeemed, bought with his blood. And we sing that song in heaven, the 24 uh, elders, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints. I believe the church is in heaven in Revelation chapter 4. John saw that. And we don't go through the tribulation period. And I like that. I don't know about you, but I like that. And then reason number six, we return with Christ at his second coming. With Christ at his second coming. Remember I told you he comes to get us at the rapture. We're snatched away to be with him. And then at the return of Christ, it says that the saints come with him. Now, if the rapture happened at the return if it's all the same thing, the, the, the Lord comes back, we are raptured up, but he's not, he's not taking us to the Father's house because we're coming right back down. So it's almost like we just run into him and then he takes us back down. Here's a picture that kind of shows this little loop that happens with the post-tribulation rapture. It's at the end of the tribulation period, the rapture and the second coming are kind of one event, and we just do a little loop. We go up and we come back down. Uh, the question is, what do you go up for? I mean, you're just coming right back down. It doesn't seem to make much sense to go, you're not going to the Father's house because the Lord's coming back to the earth. Here's the problem with a post-tribulation rapture person. Big, big problem. The millennial kingdom. When Jesus comes back for his return, fights the battle of Armageddon, defeats all his enemies, he wipes everybody out that doesn't believe in him. And he sets up his kingdom, and the only people going into his kingdom are believers in Jesus. Now, if you have the rapture that comes at the end of the tribulation, so all these people get saved during the tribulation, and we're the, the church is still around, so we're all there. We get raptured up. Well, when you get raptured, you get changed. You've, you're given a glorified body. So we get changed on the way up. We come right back down with him. He wipes out all his enemies, which is that's all that's left is enemies. So he sets up his kingdom. Who populates the kingdom? You don't have any flesh and blood people to populate the kingdom because we've all been raptured and changed and we're all glorified saints. And so we're all in the kingdom, but there are no babies being born in the kingdom. And there are no flesh and blood people in the kingdom because they were all raptured and glorified. So at the end of the 1,000 years, when the devil is released from his confinement, the Bible says he draws away uh, so many people like the sand of the seashore to rebel against the Lord. How are you going to do that? You can't do that with glorified saints. So the post-tribulation millennial person, the person that says, well, Jesus is coming back at the end of the tribulation, you have serious problems with the millennial kingdom because it doesn't work. You can't have a millennial kingdom if everybody is glorified. So that's why I believe that Jesus Christ is coming next. It's called the blessed hope in Titus chapter 2. It's to comfort you and me 
to know that the Lord is coming soon. And the big question is this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Larry Norman was a Christian musician, singer, and songwriter. And he wrote a song about the rapture way back when in the early 70s. The lyrics say this. Life was filled with guns and war. And all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. The children died. The days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. A man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears, and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. The father spoke. The demons dined. How could you have been so blind? There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. My friend, the Lord is coming soon, and now is the time, if you're not ready, to get yourself ready. Simply pray this prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again from the dead, and that you are Lord of all. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart today, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real life.